So we've talked about the selection and hiring process, how to develop and socialize staff, and the next step for managers to make sure that adequate numbers and appropriate mix of personnel are available to meet the unit needs and organizational goals. So chapter 17 is gonna talk about staffing needs and scheduling policies. We're gonna look at different methods for determining staffing, staffing needs, communicating staffing plans, and developing and communicating, communicating schedule policies. So let's get started here. So why is scheduling so difficult in nursing? It doesn't fit a traditional business cycle, right? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There's an erratic and unpredictable healthcare demand. High level expertise is required 24 seven. The stress of the job requires balanced work and recreational schedule. And staffing mix varies with acuity. Although many organizations now use staffing clerks and computers to assist with staffing, the overall responsibility for scheduling continues to be an important function of that first and middle level manager. What is the difference in centralized versus decentralized staffing? In centralized staffing, staffing decisions are made by personnel in a central office or staffing center. This may or may not be registered nurses, but the authoritarian should be a nurse to help carry out the day-to-day -day activities. In decentralized staffing, each department is responsible for its own staffing. The unit manager is responsible for covering all scheduled concerns. Decentralized scheduling and staffing lead to increased autonomy and flexibility, but centralized staffing is fairer to all employees because policies tend to be employed more consistently and impartially. Organizations have the ability to use centralized or decentralized staffing. Each staffing technique has their own strengths and limitations. And you can see in this chart that some of the strengths of centralized staffing include organizational wide view of staffing needs so seeing that big picture and where are the needs primarily needed. Staffing policies tend to be employed more consistently and impartially because policies are in place to treat each employee more fairly. It's more cost effective because staff resources can be utilized and considered for more units throughout the facility. And it frees that middle level manager to complete other management functions. Some of the limitations include um, less flexibility for the workers, and then managers may be less responsive to personnel budget um, control because of scheduling and staffing matters. Some of the um, advantages for decentralized staffing include managers retain greater control. The manager understands the unit and the staff intimately, which leads to making sound staff decisions effectively. Staff can take requests directly to their manager, so the staff feel more in control of their work environment because they have that capability of requesting time off directly. And then it provides for greater autonomy and flexibility for the individual staff member. But with rewards of decentralized staffing, there are always some risks, and those may be resulting in more special pleading and arbitrary treatments of employees, some treatment can be unequal or inconsistent among staff. Many are may be very cost effective, sorry, may not be very cost effective for organizations because staffing needs are not viewed holistically. They're not looking at that big picture and more time consuming for the unit manager. So just know the differences between centralized and decentralized staffing and how do those differ with strengths and limitations. And this slide just recaps again, decentralized scheduling and staffing can lead to increased autonomy and flexibility, but centralized staffing is fair for all of the employees. It is important to remember that centralized and decentralized staffing is not synonymous with centralized and decentralized decision-making. Those are two different concepts.
This slide lists some of the common staffing and scheduling options in healthcare organizations. I think managers have to be very creative at times with scheduling and staffing, but this list will give you a few that you will likely see in your careers. There's definitely advantages and disadvantages with each option. When we talk about our 10 or 12 hour shifts, these have become commonplace. There is a debate that extended shift hours result in judgment errors related to fatigue, longer shifts, and working overtime can be significantly associated with lower quality of care, worse patient safety reports, and more care left undone. Some of the advantages to note for longer hours just include that there's less hours and days to work, helping balance that personal and work lifestyle. Um, there's less child care issues, reduced stress, and increased work continuity and accountability. When we think about premium pay for weekend work, we can sometimes still see weekend option staff that may work the two weekend days and get paid for 36 hours. Part-time staffing pool for weekend shifts and holidays. You may see cyclical staffing, which just allows long-term knowledge of future work schedules because a set staffing pattern is repeated every few weeks. Um, when I first started at Children's Mercy, I had a cyclical staffing. So I made a six week schedule basically. And in week one, I worked Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, week two, I worked Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever. But every time week one rolled around, it was the same thing, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Every week two was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it was a cyclical staffing. So I could really make my schedule for an entire year based off of a six week schedule. And then job sharing is that last one there. Use of supplemental staffing from outside registries and float pools is another common scheduling option. Shift bidding allows nurses to bid for shifts rather than require mandatory overtime. Some scheduling alternatives may include supplemental nursing staffing with agency nurses or travel nurses. We probably, um, we endured lots of travel nurses during the pandemic. Agency nurses are those directly employed by an external nursing agency that work for premium pay without any benefits. Travel nurses are nurses that travel, travel to multiple locations for employment on a short-term contract basis. Agency and travel nurses are usually directly employed by external sources and work for premium pay. These nurses help tremendously during high acuity or census time or during the pandemic, but continuous use of these nurses can be very expensive and usually results in poor continuity of nursing care. Flex time is a system that allows employees to select the time schedules that best meet their personal needs while still meeting work responsibilities. This may mean that staff come at different times of the day and end at different times of the day. Um, that seems like a manager's nightmare. So they have to definitely address the consequences of the staffing system by promoting continuity of care when there are different start and end times. When we think about self-scheduling, this just allows the nurse and a unit to work together to construct their own schedules rather than schedules created by the management. And that's currently what I do as a self-schedule Right, I can, they tell me it's time to schedule and I get six weeks and I just self-schedule when, when I can work. Float pools, some hospitals have created their own internal supplemental staff by hiring employees and creating a float pool. So this, their float pool is their own nurses, um, but they can float and be cross-trained on multiple units so they can work additional hours during periods of high census, worker shortages, they're not hired per diem, so they do not receive less pay. Float nurses are able to receive benefits just like everybody else. Um, they can still, they can fill staffing holes um, because they're internally hired. When we think about per diem staffing, staff generally work, have the flexibility to choose when they want to work, but in exchange for this flexibility, they receive higher rate of pay, but usually no benefits. As of July 2022, the average hourly pay for a per diem nurse in the United States was $40.89. 
um, per hour. Um, per diem workers may increase risk to patient safety because they're less likely to be familiar with organizational policies and procedures. Nursing shortages occur periodically and it's very difficult for the profession to accurately predict exactly when and where those are going to happen. Healthcare organizations have implemented solutions to help combat shortage problems. Some of these solutions include cross training, closed unit staffing, and mandatory overtime. So when we talk about closed unit staffing, this occurs when the staff members on a unit make a commitment to cover all absences and needed extra um, to help themselves in return for not being pulled from the unit in times of low census. A, and we'll get to actually mandatory nursing here shortly. Um, a formula for calculating nursing care hours per patient day is shown here. Um, we've talked about this a little bit in other chapters. Nursing care hours per patient day is the total number of nursing care hours worked in a 24-hour period divided by the patient census for that 24 hours. This is the simplest formula in use and continues to be used widely. This formula helps all nursing and ancillary staff to be treated equally for determining hours of nursing care without differentiating acuity levels of patients. But because of this factor, this could result in incomplete or even inaccurate picture of nursing care needs. This measurement tool may be too restrictive because it does not re represent fluctuating in patient care and staffing. Patient classification systems were developed in the 60s as a method to classify patients. Different criteria are used for different systems. Nursing classifies patients based on acuity. These patient care systems group patients according to specific characteristics that measure acuity of illness in an effort to determine both the number and mix of staff needed to provide safe, adequate care. There are several types of patient care systems. Um, once it's adopted, um, hours of nursing care must be assigned for each patient classification. So we've already discussed there are several types of patient care systems. Um, the critical indicator of these uses broad indicators such as bathing, diet, IV fluids, medications, uh, positioning to categorize patient care activities. As far as summative tasks, patient care systems require the nurse to know the frequency of occurrence of specific activities, treatments, and procedures for each patient. So for example, a summative task may ask the nurse if the patient requires time for teaching, elimination, or hygiene. At the national level, the use of PCS is a condition for participation in Medicare and is required by the Joint Commission for Certification. So how do we determine the relationship between staffing and quality of care? We have to look at staffing mix, staffing ratios, and number of staff. Staffing mix could include number of RNs, LPNs, and UAPs. Determining appropriate skill mix will depend on the patient care setting, the acuity of the patient, and other factors. When we think about staffing ratios, this can improve patient care, nurse retention, reduce burnout, and improve morale, right? A staffing ratio of one to two patients versus one to eight patients, right? Is gonna keep you as a nurse, it's gonna reduce your burnout, and it's gonna improve morale. The number of staff should be based on knowledgeable trained nurses that can imperatively reach desired patient outcomes. What happens when RN hours decrease due to staff mixing or staff ratios? The literature notes that when organizations decrease RN hours, this can lead to increased adverse patient outcomes. These adverse patient outcomes can include medication errors, patient falls, decreased pain management. Staffing levels should be considered an important, not, but not the only factor in safe patient care. Regardless of how the manager chooses to deal with an adequate number of staff, criteria uh, managers must meet when handling understaffing issues include decisions made must meet the state and federal labor laws. 
Staff must not be demoralized or excessively fatigued. Patient care must not be jeopardized. So let's talk a little bit about mandatory overtime. In mandatory overtime, employees are forced to work additional shifts, often under threat of patient abandonment. While mandatory overtime is neither efficient nor effective, it has an even more devastating short-term impact in terms of staff perception of lack of control and subsequent impact on mood, motivation, and productivity. Frequent use of overtime creates a safety risk because exhausted nurses are much more likely to commit errors. This practice is costly, but does not have a major bearing on continuity of care. Mandatory overtime should be a, the very last resort, not standard operating procedures because an institution does not have enough staff. California's mandatory RN staffing ratios, they are the only state in the United States that has an enacted legislation requiring mandatory staffing ratios. Um, the answer as to whether mandated ratios have improved care or created new cost burdens for California is still unclear. They do have minimum staffing ratios would not have been proposed in the first place had staffing abuses and the resultant decline in the quality of patient care not occurred. ANA's recommendation to maintain sufficient staffing are listed here. Um, the formation of nurse-driven staffing committees to create staffing plans. Legislators mandate specific nurse-to-patient ratios in legislation or regulation. And then facilities are required to disclose staffing levels to the public and or regulatory body. Facilities do have fiscal years and must be fiscally accountable. Fiscal accountability to the organization for staffing is not incompatible with ethical accountability to patients and staff. It should be possible to stay within a staffing budget and meet the needs of patients and the staff. Generational diversity may also impact staffing needs. We are among a time where five generations of nurses are in the workplace. You can see on the slide here the different um, generations that are represented. This actually shows just four. Silent generation, yeah, we're probably pushing it if silent generation personnel are still in the workplace. They may be volunteers at this point though. So let's say four to five of the generations are being represented. We know that generation, different generations bring different values to the workplace. The silent generation or veteran generation, those born between 1925 to 1942, represent a very small amount of employed nurses. These nurses tend to be more risk averse, highly respectful of authority, supportive of hierarchy and disciplined. Their work values are traditional, traditional and they are often recognized for their loyalty. When we think about the baby boomers, these are 1943 to early 1960s. Um, this group represents about 50% of the current workplace. These nurses tend to be more materialistic and are willing to work long hours in an effort to get ahead. Um, these are your workaholics. Um, this group results in a greater creativity and are best suited for work environments that are flexible and independent thinking. Our Generation X are our early 60s to the 80s. Um, this is a much smaller cohort of nurses from baby boomers and even Generation Y. These nurses tend to lack interest in lifetime employment at one place. They're family oriented. They enjoy leisure time at home. This group will question the rules. Um, and then there's Generation Y or millennials. This cohort represents optimism, self-confidence, relationship orientation, volunteer mindedness, and social consciousness. These guys are very tech savvy. And then Gen Z is starting to enter that workforce, um, 1996 to 2015. Sociologists believe Gen Z will be similar to the silent generation as both group, groups grew up with unsettled and economic insecurities. These generation differences make may cause some tension and conflict. Um, general, generational diversity 
like cultural diversity, should be viewed as a strength in the workplace. Nurses will be more satisfied in the workplace if staffing and scheduling policies are thoughtfully developed, fairly applied, and clearly communicated to all employees. Written policies generally provide a means for greater consistency and fairness. In addition to the staffing and scheduling option policies that we have previously discussed. So what are some of the policies that should be addressed organizationally? Sick leave, vacations, holidays, call offs for low census, on call pay, tardiness and absenteeism, and shift work. Staffing policies should be formalized by the manager and communicated to all personnel. So when staffing policies occur, everyone should know what they are saying. Um, so this slide here shows an example checklist of employee staffing policies. Um, the name of the person responsible for the staffing schedule. What's the type and length of staffing cycle used? The rotation policy, fixed shift transfer policies, time and location of schedule posting, when the shift begins and ends, weekend off policy, tardiness policy, low census, absentee policy, policy for trading days off or days off request procedures, policies regarding rotating to other units, vacation time, holiday time, conflicts, emergency requests, transfer requests, mandatory overtime. So if we have an employee staffing policy and all of these are listed, every employee should understand what's in each policy. It must not, the staffing and scheduling policies cannot violate labor laws, state or national laws or union contracts, and they must be uniform staffing and scheduling policies and procedures must be written and communicated to all staff. And that concludes chapter 17. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we can chat about it in class. Thanks guys.